Welcome to our webinar today. We're going to be providing a presentation on extracting smart data from big data. I'm going to introduce myself, Oliver Playstow. I manage Ang Angos Amir and APAC. I actually joined Angos over eight years ago at a time when we focused primarily on delivering data mining applications. Over the years I've seen our increase in market share, but also a range of new enterprise technologies to help organizations with their end-to-end -end predictive analytic requirements. I'm going to introduce you to Amanda Beedham. Amanda has worked in predictive analytics for over 15 years now, supporting a range of verticals including financial services, telecoms and insurance. Amanda's role at Angos involves pre-sales, training, consultancy and also heavily involved with our product development. Previously, Amanda worked for SPSS and she also holds a degree in statistics from the University of Exeter. Okay, so for today's agenda, what is the big data platform? We're really going to be focusing on Angos's view of big data, the big data platform, and how to establish return on investment from it. We're also going to identify some of the major challenges that we've seen in the industry over the last couple of years. The focal point of Amanda's presentation will be providing an overview of Angos's ability to generate that ROI from your big data asset. It will we'll also cover the methodology to achieve that through a live demonstration of a recent project we delivered with a client. First of all, I think it's interesting to cover why a big data platform. What is a big data platform? In recent years, there's been quite a lot of buzz around big data and predictive analytics. Your CEO, your CIO, CMO are all talking about it, but it's also become a company priority throughout the organization and big budget has been allocated to this. With this, there's been increased pressure to maintain competitive advantage and derive revenue directly from your data asset. New technologies have created many new data feeds from multiple sources. Traditional data warehouses cannot facilitate immediate data-driven decisions. The sheer volume of vendors and tools options available to advanced analytics currently in the market can be quite daunting to buyers. Part of the today's discussion will focus on important capabilities of big data platforms and the technology developments that, which facilitate the processing of big data. In terms of the current big data platform, I'd like to start out by describing its purpose. Organizations are looking to consolidate their unprecedented data in a cold store. And at Angos, we view that big data platform being a cold store and your traditional data warehouse being your warm store where you've got structured data. On the technology side of things, the big data platform was created by leveraging clusters of computers to process vast data volumes with the leading environment over the last couple of years being Apache Hadoop. Hadoop is not actually a single software, it's a set of different tools designed to work with data stored across several different machines or clusters. Hadoop Distributed File System, HDFS, is the environment where all these tools sit. MapReduce was created to look at the interaction with HDFS. However, we've seen interacting with MapReduce can be quite challenging. And that's why we've seen the birth of tools like Pig, Hive, Impala, as they look to simplify the interaction with your data. Some of the advantages of Hadoop, it's resistant to computer failures since it replicates the data across different computers. It's easily able to esca escalate from few computers to several hundreds. And it's also not limited to the traditional relational database format. So you can preserve the original format of your data and not lose information that might be useful once your company has a meaning for that processing. We have discussed why organizations need a big data platform, but what are the challenges within the data itself? Like traditional data warehouses, there have been many complexities within big data, and we like to consolidate these data challenges into the four Vs. We have already touched on the volume of data and why Hadoop was created to divide data across multiple clusters of computers. The variety of data is the next one. This causes significant issues in data preparation for modeling. Telecoms, financial services, and insurance businesses have experienced using the same data structures and data variables for over 15 years now. They are also seeing new sources of data through text logs in call centers, web traffic, smart devices, telematic devices in cars, TV behavior, and of course, social media. The veracity of data is one of the major problems that have challenged traditional data analysts, as well as the new big data scientist, because there isn't the methodology to assess the strength of data quality. That reduces businesses' confidence in the predictive power of the data and how it can actually be used in a live application. And finally, the velocity of data is also a traditional problem that has been expanded due to the sheer volume. 
So when we're talking about the velocity, we're also talking about how often data is being updated. A simple example of this is that if you're building a propensity model or predictive model and you're looking at billing information as an example to drive customer behavior, how quickly can you get customer billing information and how often does it get updated into this cold store? If it's only once a month, and then in theory you can only use this information once a month. If it's in real time, then you can de deploy in real time applications. Complexities really arrive when you have multiple data sources with different timing of updates, which give businesses major challenges implementing these models. Most organizations are looking at the big data and data warehouse as an important asset. How to make that asset more valuable can be summarized in three areas. Methodology to analyze and productionalize data, visualize your business KPIs, key performance indicators, and most important, in my point of view, is what is the clear objective that you're trying to solve. In terms of methodology, we haven't seen an industry standard approach over the last few years to assess and combine both big data algorithms and traditional models. And that's really been driven through various different predictive analytic techniques, both in big data environment and also within your SAS or SQL or SPSS environment. Most data insight and predictive models fail to be deployed in operational systems over the years, mainly due to the fact that analysts have failed to contextualize the value that is given to the business problem. You can only do that if you know what the question you're asking your data. And we've highlighted the big question. Many organizations are going to their data scientists and asking them to tell them something new about their big data store that they've invested in. But yes, unless someone is actually driving that question, there isn't a technology out there just to find new actionable insights. So how do we analyze smart data? We apply the traditional modeling process and we filter big data to create enhancements and also predictive lists. We follow the crisp DM methodology to consult with the business to make sure that variables that are predictive or have been generating insight are available to implement in terms of business rules or decisions. We look to consolidate both the data sources to fill that predictive model and deploy them. And today we have a case study that Amanda is going to provide a demonstration within our platform. The objective was to assess the impact of TV customer churn to a telco with a view to building a strategy to identify high risk customers and also recommendations for better engagement. Our methodology was to use traditional approach to identify business value with and without predictive models, then process the big data store to segment the most predictive variables for model improvement. The key takeaway is our ability to assess and build predictive models in both data warehouse and big data store and visualize the business impact of these combined solutions to executives. The visualization and business impact is also referred to uh, as the monopolization of your data asset. I'm going to pass you over to Amanda now who's going to carry out this presentation. After Amanda's presentation I'm going to take you through some of the business benefits the client um, experience with us and then following that we'll open up this webinar to any Q&A. We're going to start by building a model to predict churn for pay-per-view or on-demand programming. To do this, we're going to build a model initially based on traditional data sources. So if we look at these data sources, first of all, we have a contracts file by customer and by product, which contains the start date and the end date of the contract alongside the amount paid. We are now going to roll this data up to the customer level, and we're going to combine or merge this data set with some customer summary statistics. We then perform some variable transformations to end up with the final data mining view um, at the contracts level. And here we have one row per customer. We can see we have the package that that customer is on. We know whether the customer was exposed to a promotion or not. And we know how long they've been a customer with the telco. And we also know what packages the customer is uh, purchasing. Some of these packages are monthly. For example, here we have a, a sports monthly package and a family monthly package. And we also know whether the customer has purchased the pay-per-view packages, which is the on-demand programming. So here we have a customer that has bought the uh, movie pay-per-view on-demand programming eight times. So we have pay-per-view for sports and movies and family and so on. We also have information on the, the cost of the packages um, and also the pay-per-view cost and we know how much revenue has been made uh, by TV and in total. We also know whether the customer has churned and also more importantly whether the customer has churned from pay-per-view and this is the field that we would like to predict whether the customer has churned from the on-demand programming. So we're now ready to build a customer churn model. 
We're going to use the contracts data that we've just built. We're going to merge it with some bureau scores and some customer demographics. So if we look at the data set attributes report, we can see that we have 825,000 records containing variables um, concerning customer demographics like age, gender and income. We also have information on the program packages that customers have bought alongside various revenue figures, um, costs and the pay-per-view churn which we want to predict. The next step is to partition the data set into training and test samples. We will then build our traditional model on the training data set. So if we focus on the decision tree that is being used to predict pay-per-view churn. We can see that the overall churn rate uh, for the entire data set is 32%. And the most important predictor of customer churn is the length of time as a customer. So those customers who've been with the organization or the telco for more than two years are much more likely to churn. We have um, a segment over at the bottom here with a 90% churn rate. And this um, concerns those customers who've been with the company for over two years. They are using the on-demand sports um, pay-per-view package and they're, they're on the base uh, package too. Um, if we look at those customers who've been with the organization for less than two years, then we can see that income is the next best predictor. So those customers on a higher income are indeed much more likely to churn. The next step is to try and assess how accurate our model is to evaluate model performance. To do this, we're going to use the model analyzer. And this will give us um, a look at the, the cumulative lift chart or the gains chart. Um, and we can also look at the ROC chart, the receiver operating characteristic curve, to understand model performance. We can see here that the AUC statistic is about 0.73 or 0.74, which is under the threshold of 0.75, uh, which we consider good enough to, for the model to be considered robust. So what this is telling me is that our model um, is, although it's explaining customer churn to a certain extent, we're not fully understanding the entire patterns of customer churn. So what we need to do next is to enrich this data set in order to build a better model. In order to improve model performance, we would like to incorporate buffering information, which will tell us about the extent of any interruptions in programming. We will then determine if these have an impact on customer churn. Here we have buffering information for one customer over one day. We know that if the buffering took place at the start of the program or if the buffering took place during the middle of the program, we also know how long these interruptions lasted. The data set for all customers is very large and is stored in Hadoop. To import this data, we will use the generic code node. Here we've set up proc Hadoop to pull data from the Hadoop distributed environment into a relational form where it can be queried. The next step is to use proc SQL to aggregate the data to the customer level. We can take a look at the extracted data set. For each customer, we know the frequency of each type of buffering event, whether these events occurred at the start or during the program, and whether these events were over 10 seconds, more than a minute, or more than five minutes. So here we've demonstrated how to move from big data to smart data. We are now ready to create our final data mining view, which incorporates our original contracts data, the bureau data, our customer demographics alongside our buffering information, which is our smart data. We will do a match merge to merge those data sources together and perform some variable transformations. As our final data set contains both traditional data and buffering information, we will hopefully be able to build a model that better predicts customer churn. Before we build our model, let's have a look um, and explore the data set to try and understand which are going to be the key drivers of pay-per-view churn. So here we have our variables rank ordered in terms of predictive power and we can see the number of five minute buffering events in the middle of the program are an important predictor, um, followed by the income, the length of time as a customer. We've also got other buffering events that appear at the start of the program, one minute buffering events and five minute buffering events. So it appears that the interruptions in the programming are an important factor in predicting customer churn. So we'll see if that becomes significant within the model. So here we've built a second decision tree to predict pay-per-view churn. If we look at this decision tree, we can see that the churn rate again is 32% in the root node. And we can see the length of time as a customer is the most important predictor. But within those customers who've been with the company for more than two years, the next most important predictor is the number of five-minute buffering events that occur within the middle of the program. And those customers that have had more than 11 of these buffering events seem to have churned at a much higher rate than everybody else.
There's a group um, down here with a 94% churn rate, and these are people who uh, have been customers for more than two years. They've had more than 11 of these five-minute uh, buffering events. Uh, they have the sports, uh, they've used the sports pay-per-view product, and they have the complete package. So within these, this group, there's a 94% churn rate. We can also see as well that there are also buffering events that are occurring at other places within the tree. So this is the number of five-minute buffering events in the center of the program, which appears here as well. But we've also got the number of one-minute buffering events too. So it looks that the quality of the program delivery is an important factor in predicting customer churn. We now need to assess how accurate this model is. And to do this, we're going to get, again use the model analyzer. So we can see that the cumulative lift chart, the, the lift appears to be um, good. And if we look at the ROC or the receiver operating characteristic curve, we can see that the AUC statistic is now 0.78, which is above the threshold of 0.75 that we require for a model to be considered robust. What we need to do now is compare the traditional decision tree with the new decision tree based upon that smart data. And when we do this, we can see that the lift of the new model incorporating the smart data is far above the lift of the traditional model. And if we compare the two ROC curves, we can see that the smart model has a much higher AUC statistic than the traditional model. So it looks like the smart model is performing much better and is a much more accurate predictor of churn. So we found out that incorporating smart data into your models can give rise to significant lift. But what about return on investment? Angle strategy trees provide a way to measure the impact of this customer churn on the business. Here we have built a strategy tree based on the structure of our smart decision tree model. We have overlaid some key performance indicators which will tell us about the impact of customer churn on each segment of the data. These indicators show average monthly profit, average monthly revenue and also monthly exposure at the level of the customer and for the segment of, as a whole. We can define exposure as the loss incurred to the business due to customer churn. The root node shows us that for the entire data set, we are losing on average $2.40 per customer per month due to churn. We can also see that the total cost of churn across all customers is $2 million every month. Let's now look at some segments of interest. We'll focus on a segment of customers on the right-hand side of the tree who've been with the telco for less than two years. They're on a higher income and have a large number of five-minute buffering events at the start and also join the program. The average monthly exposure per customers is $7.91, which is three times the sample average. The churn rate is very high at 81%. Most worrying is the overall monthly exposure, which shows the cost of the business every month within this entire segment due to pay-per-view churn is $637,000. We've assigned a treatment to this group, which is the action that we will take to deal with this problem. We know that the churn is impacted by the poor quality of program delivery. So to rectify this, we will send out an apology letter offering a 75% rebate to all customers within this segment. The segment above represents customers who've been with the organization for less than two years. They're also on a high income and have a high number of five minute buffering events during the program. And they also have been exposed to some buffering events at the start of the program. For this segment, the churn rate is 48%. The average monthly exposure per customer is $4.67, which is double the sample average. The overall monthly exposure, i.e. the cost of the business due to churn, is over half a million dollars. For this reason, we will send out an apology letter to customers in this segment, offering a 50% rebate to try and reduce customer churn. We can look at other segments towards the top of the tree and we can see that these segments are not affected by buffering events. So it's not the quality of program delivery that's affecting churn. We can still see that churn is occurring, um, although it's having a lower impact in terms of exposure. So for these customers, we've offered a different type of strategy. Uh, we're offering them a renewal letter or maybe an offer to try and in incentivize them to stay with the company. In a similar way, we have built a strategy tree using the structure of the traditional decision tree model. Again, we have overlaid key performance indicators relating to profit, revenue and exposure. As we have no information on the buffering events in this data set, we have applied different treatments to those in the smart model strategy tree. Here we have a segment on the right containing customers who've been with a telco for less than two years. They're on a high income and use the monthly movie package. The average monthly exposure per customer is $7.36, which is three times the sample average. 
the overall exposure, i.e. the cost of the business per month of those customers churning is $768,000. For this reason, in order to combat churn, we're offering a 30% discount to all customers within this segment. There are other segments in the tree where we have also offered discounts and the discount rate offered is dependent upon the churn rate and the level of exposure at the customer and segment level. Now that we've built our smart strategy tree model, it needs to be deployed. One way to do this is via code generation. Code can be automatically generated in a variety of formats, including SQL, XML, PMML and the language of SAS. We have two examples here of this cogeneration. Firstly, SQL cogeneration, and secondly, cogeneration in the language of SAS. Note that in both of these codes, what has been deployed or what has been applied to each segment is the treatment or the action that we wish to take. But what about exporting our data back into our Hadoop environment? Well, here we have a scored data set that has been scored using the smart strategy tree model in Knowledge Studio. This table can be exported back into the Hadoop environment using the language of SAS within the generic code node. In this way, the results of our smart model can be uploaded into Hadoop in order to be utilized by the telco. Thank you, Amanda. I would like to conclude the presentation by summarizing the business benefits we receive with the client. First of all, we managed to visualize the business problem, £1.9 million worth of revenue for this client per month attributed to TV content. The enhanced model enabled the business to identify 72% churn by targeting the top 37% of the population. Combining both the propensity model and the value of spend, we managed to build a strategy that increased revenue by 28%. And what did that mean for the actual business? The business value equated to £450,000 per month, and the additional lift from using big data variables was 100 k just one customer model, and we've shown the, the value of predictive modeling, but also an ROI on the big data asset. This client was able to share this with executives and fuel many different stakeholders wanting to assess the impact of big data. So as we lead on to the q and I'd like to apologize for any technical issues that you've experienced in this webinar. We will be sending out a, a recording of this webinar so that you can share that with your colleagues. Um, we have been inundated with questions. Um, I'm going to open up um, these questions to Amanda. Um, the first one that's come through, Amanda, is um, we've seen some code in the language of SAS. Is it possible to run other SAS code within the Angle software? Um, yes, we can. Um, we have a generic code node within our Angle software product, and that allows you to both uh, write your code and then run that uh, mid uh, within the workflow, but also you can copy and paste the a code from the language of SAS from that you've written elsewhere, uh, put it into, into the generic code node and run it automatically. So yes, you can. Thank you. Um, the next question, I've seen this question quite a few times over the years. Uh, what size data sets can Angos software handle? Well, there's not really a limit to the size of the data set that, that um, our software can handle. It's really going to depend upon um, the size of your machine. We do have a server version of the product if you have particularly large data sets. Uh, we have done some testing over the years, and uh, we, we can confirm that we can handle 4 billion records and 65,000 columns. But as I said, there's not really an official limit because it's going to depend upon your machine's uh, memory. Great. Is there a way to filter the variables based on their ability to predict the dependent variable after loading them inside Angos? Yes, there is. We often find that many of our customers have very wide data sets, so they may have several hundred variables. And one thing they'd like to do is to reduce down the number of variables. Um, so using a decision tree, or we have a measure of predictive power table, um, from here you can generate a list of variables or a filter of variables, uh, which will be a reduced set of top predictors. And this can then be um, applied within any dialog box within the Angle software product. Fantastic. I'm going to try and focus on some short questions here. Um, can, can Angos be connected to Spark? Yes, um, we have an R node um, available with Angos, and that's um, so you can use the Spark R package to um, connect to, to Spark. Great. Um, I've got another environmental question here. Can Angos be executed inside, inside a Unix environment? Yes, absolutely. Um, we have a version that's compatible with um, Debian and Ubuntu. 
Okay, I'm going to pick um, a business context question. How do you calculate the business? Uh, how do you sorry? How do you calculate the benefit of smart PPV churn model? Yes, what we did here was that we first of all we found uh, the, the the smart model, which was a decision tree incorporating uh, the buffering information from the Hadoop environment. We then led on some key performance indicators. Um, as you saw, many of those were related to exposure. Um, at the the, the the customer individual customer level um, and at the segment level, um, and from this we could figure out the um, impact the business for each segment um, of churn, and that allowed us to then um, apply the appropriate strategies to deal with that churn. Okay, uh, last couple of questions. Um, the rest of the the, uh, the questions we will document and distribute to the attendees. Um, can Angos be integrated with any Hadoop distribution? Um, yes, we use uh, the World Programming System um, for establishing a connection to HDFS um, environments. Uh, we've so far successfully uh, tested the major Hadoop providers such as Cloudera. One final question, Amanda, please. Um, is Angos a Hadoop graphic interface or a Hadoop manager? Um, it's not. Angos offers a way to interact with Hadoop, uh, with a Hadoop cluster uh, via Proc Hadoop um, in WPS. Um, and it's able to load and unload data in a single step, but it is independent from your Hadoop in installation. Fantastic. Thank you, Amanda. So thank you, everyone, for attending. I'm conscious of um, keeping this to a, a half an hour webinar. We will document all the additional questions and distribute them on email to you. Um, we will also share a recording of this webinar so you can share that with colleagues. Um, please feel free to contact us if you have any further questions after we close this webinar. Many thank you.